Well, then ready to um, dive into a pretty big moment, a turning point, really, in, well, space history. Today, we're zeroing in on Mercury Redstone 3, better known, I think, as Freedom 7. It was America's first crewed space flight back on May 5th, 1961, with Alan Shepard at the controls. Absolutely. And it's worth remembering, for our listener, the core aim. The U.S. wanted to prove Shepard could handle the, well, the intense stresses of a suborbital flight. And test, really thoroughly test, the Mercury capsule systems you see. Of course, the grand goal of Project Mercury, the big one, was always to get into orbit. Exactly. And you can't talk about Freedom 7 without the backdrop of, well, the space race. The yeah. Soviets had already pulled off an orbital flight, hadn't they, with Yuri Gagarin. So for America, this was suborbital, sure, but there was a lot riding on it. Oh, without a doubt. And that suborbital aspect, it's key. Freedom 7 reached space, yes, but didn't have the oomph, the velocity, you know, for a proper orbit. Think of it as a stepping stone, a vital one, even if it was a shorter hop. It was paving the way, laying the groundwork for those later orbital missions. For this deep dive, we've got quite the pile of material. We have mission notes, capsule specifics, a timeline of events, bios for the main players, a briefing document, even a study guide. Our goal as always is to go through it all and pick out the most, well, the most important bits, the interesting bits for you. So where should we begin? The spacecraft itself, perhaps? A sensible place to start. Mercury capsule number seven. A bit of a plain name at first, wasn't it? Arrived at Cape Canaveral, December 9th, 1960. And even though other capsules were available, weren't they? The decision was made to wait for number seven specifically. Why was that? Yes, there were others. But number seven had been earmarked way back in the summer of 60, you see. It was intended for this, the first crewed flight. But when it arrived, well, it was clear that a lot of development, a lot of testing was still needed. It wasn't quite ready for a human passenger. But the choice to stick with it, despite the delays, it shows how vital this capsule was to the program, especially in those early stages. A sign of um, thoroughness, then, would you say? And then, of course, Shepard came along and named it Freedom 7. A rather fitting name, I'd say. Quite right. Shepard believed in following tradition, you know, pilots naming their aircraft. He discussed it with his wife Louise, with John Glenn, the backup pilot, and with Robert Gilruth, the head of the Mercury program. And they all approved. Now, about that seven in Freedom 7, a lot of people get that wrong, don't they? It wasn't about the seven Mercury astronauts themselves. No, not directly. The seven actually refers to the McDonnell model number seven. That was the factory designation for Shepard spacecraft, you see, in the Mercury program. However, the number resonated, you could say, with the other astronauts. They liked the symbolism. So they started adding seven to their spacecraft names as well. So Shepard, without meaning to, started a trend. First, that Mercury spacecraft would have names, and second, what those names would be like. And it was the Mercury Redstone launch vehicle, wasn't it, that lifted Freedom 7 off the ground? That's right, the Mercury Redstone, a vital piece of engineering. And speaking of thoroughness, they were quite careful with that launch vehicle as well. There were worries about its reliability, weren't there? Especially after the MR2 test flight, the one with Ham the Chimp. Ah, oh, yes, Ham's flight. <laughs> Didn't quite go as planned, did it? Higher G-forces than they expected, the flight went on longer, and recovering the capsule was a bit of a struggle, if I remember correctly. You're absolutely right. The MR2 flight ran into some, well, some hiccups. The flight went a bit off script, ended up going further and faster than intended. Ham had to endure more G-force than planned. And landing! Well, the capsule landed miles away from where it was supposed to. It took them ages to retrieve it. So naturally, people began to question if the Redstone was really up to the job, ready for a human passenger. And so, very sensibly, they added another test flight. Uncrewed this time. MRBD, wasn't it? Okay. Booster Development Flight, I think they called it. Precisely. NASA decided to do another test without a crew to look closely at the Redstone booster to address those worries that cropped up after MR2. This MRBD flight, they launched it in late March of 61, went pretty smoothly, instilled more confidence, you know, that the vehicle was ready for a crewed mission. Of course, this extra testing pushed back the MR3 timeline. The original plan was for March. But you see, this whole episode demonstrated how important it was to test and test again. They took the data from each flight, used it to tweak the systems, make them more reliable. It wasn't just about getting someone into space, it was about getting them there safely, minimizing the risks as much as possible. Then there's Alan Shepard's selection as a pilot. That was decided quite a while before the actual launch, wasn't it? It was. Robert Gilruth chose Shepard in early January 61. John Glenn and Gus Grissom were his backups. But cleverly, they held back on announcing Shepard as the pilot. They waited till much closer to launch day. 
Gilruth wanted to be able to change things up if needed at the last minute. Maybe a bit cautious, but it shows the immense pressure, the scrutiny on this first crude flight. And the selection itself, oh, it was rigorous. Medical checks, psychological evaluations, and of course their experience as test pilots. All these early Mercury flights, even the unmanned ones, the ones with animals, they all added to the data pool, helped them understand how humans would react in space. It shaped how they picked and trained astronauts for future missions. Now, launch day itself, May 5th. There was, well, a bit of drama, wasn't there? I seem to recall a few delays. That's putting it mildly. They tried to launch on May 2nd, but bad weather put a stop to it just over two hours before liftoff. Shepard was already suited up, ready to go. Then the next attempt, May 4th, same story, bad weather, postponed again. Finally on the 5th, even though the weather was better, more delays, cloud cover was iffy, then a power unit played up, and they even had to reboot a computer at Goddard Space Flight Center. All these hiccups, they really highlight how complicated space launches are. So many things, the environment, the technology, everything has to be perfect, completely aligned, every hold, every issue. The engineers and mission control analyzed it all, used it to refine the launch process, learn for the future. And all that meant Shepard was stuck in the capsule for quite a while before finally getting off the ground. Absolutely. He climbed into Freedom 7 at 5.15 a.m. Eastern Time. Scheduled launch was 7.20 a.m. But those holds, those technical issues, meant he was cooped up in that spacecraft for almost three hours. Imagine the willpower it took to sit there, waiting, strapped in, knowing the risks. Those early missions, they weren't just about technology. They tested human endurance, how people react under pressure. And monitoring Shepard during those delays, that gave them valuable data, helped them understand the stress astronauts would face. And of course, there was that, well, memorable incident Shepard needed to um, relieve himself. Quite a pressing matter, given the delays. A very human moment in all the high tech. Now, they expected the mission to be short, under 20 minutes, so the Mercury suit didn't have any, well, urine collection system. But with the delays, Shepard had to tell the crew he needed to go. At first, they said no. Opening the hatch was too complicated, would take too long. But Shepard insisted. In the end, they switched off the power to his medical sensors, and, well, he had to relieve himself inside the suit. Maybe not very dignified, but it shows you that these pioneers, they were human after all, and it probably made them rethink the, um, the toilet situation for future space flights. You can't ignore basic human needs, even in space. Right. Well, let's move on to the flight itself, suborbital, as we've said. Can you walk us through the main events, the timings? Certainly. So liftoff, 00.00 on the mission clock. At 00.24, the Redstone started its pitch program, putting the spacecraft on the right path. 01.24, maximum dynamic pressure, what they call max Q. It's the point where the aerodynamic forces on the vehicle are at their peak. Booster engine cutoff, or BECO, happened at 02.2. Freedom 7 had reached its suborbital velocity by then. Two seconds later, at 02.22, they jettisoned the escape tower, no longer needed. And then at 02.24, spacecraft separation from the booster using posigrade rockets. By 02.35, the automatic attitude control system started turning the capsule around, putting the heat shield forward, ready for re-entry. And at that point, 02.35, Alan Shepard took over manual control. He was testing how the spacecraft handled. This was crucial. Allowed Shepard to give direct feedback on how responsive and stable the capsule was. Vital data for tweaking the controls for future Mercury missions and beyond. And how did he find the manual controls? I believe there's a comparison to the simulator. Yes. Shepard said the response felt broadly similar to the Mercury simulator. But there was a difference. He couldn't actually hear the control jets firing during the flight, unlike in the simulator. Too much background noise inside the capsule. This highlights the difficulty of replicating spaceflight on the ground and the importance of actually flying to see how things really work. Right. Let's carry on with the timeline. Of course. At 04.44, the retro attitude maneuver. They align the spacecraft perfectly for firing the retro rockets, the ones that slow the capsule down for its descent. They reached Apogee, the highest point, at about 05.00. Altitude was roughly 115 statute miles, downrange distance about 150 statute miles. Then retrofire at 05.15. They fired the three solid fuel retro rockets, one after the other. Getting the timing and thrust of those rockets right was critical, essential for a safe and accurate re-entry. There was a little problem with the pitch indicator during retrofire, wasn't there? Yeah. Yes, there was. Shepard got a bit confused about the pitch indicator. They'd updated the reference position for retrofire attitude, but hadn't told him. So he ended up making some unintended pitch adjustments early on in the retrofire sequence. Luckily, he was a skilled pilot, quickly recognized the issue and corrected it. It didn't jeopardize the trajectory. But this incident shows how vital communication is between mission control and the astronaut 
clear and timely communication. Especially during those high pressure moments, it likely led to a review of communication protocols just to prevent anything similar happening again. I see. What happened after Retrofire? Uh, they jettisoned the retro pack at 06.15. That's the bit with the spent retro rockets. Got rid of it to make sure it didn't interfere with the heat shield during re-entry. Funnily enough, the confirmation light for the jettison failed. Uh. A little electrical fault. But TAPCOM, Deke Slayton, he was able to confirm it for Shepard using the telemetry data. So even when something breaks inside the capsule, mission control is there watching, making sure everything is okay. They're vital to mission success and astronaut safety. Re-entry started around 07.15. That's when the capsule really felt the deceleration peaking at 11.6 gems. Quite a force for Shepard to endure. A considerable force indeed. Oh yes, quite substantial. Then at 09.38, out came the drogue parachute, deployed at 22,000 feet to start slowing the capsule down and stabilizing it. Then the main parachute, much bigger at 10.15, deployed at 10,000 feet, slowed the descent even more, ready for a safe splashdown. And finally, splashdown. North Atlantic Ocean, about 300 nautical miles from the launch site. That was at 15.22. Just over 15 minutes, packed with critical events. Everything had to happen precisely. So just over 15 minutes in total. You mentioned Shepard's observations during the flight. He could see the Earth, couldn't he, through the periscope? He could. In those early Mercury capsules, the periscope was their main way of seeing the Earth, the horizon. They had two small windows, too, but the periscope was key. Shepard did have a bit of a problem. A filter in the periscope optics wasn't quite right, affected the colors a bit. But even so, he could see the landmasses through the clouds. He reported spotting Florida's east coast, Andros Island in the Bahamas, that sort of thing. These visual observations, they weren't just for Shepard's benefit. They were gathering data, you see, about visibility from the capsule, how well the viewing systems worked. Useful for future Earth observation tasks. And he wasn't just sightseeing, he was actively testing the capsule's control systems, wasn't he? Trying out both the automatic and manual modes. Oh yes, a major part of the mission was to see how the attitude control system performed in space. Shepard used both the Automatic Stabilization and Control System, or ASCS, and the manual control system. Check how the capsule responded in pitch, yaw, and roll, the three axes of motion. He even tried the fly-by-wire mode briefly. That's where his manual stick inputs controlled the automatic jets electronically. He said it felt very smooth, gave him a real sense of control. All this testing was vital to prove that the control systems worked as they should, to give the astronauts confidence that they could fly the Mercury capsule in space. And then the recovery after splashdown. That was remarkably quick, wasn't it? It was. Freedom 7 came down in the designated area of the North Atlantic. Within minutes, the recovery aircraft were there. A helicopter from the USS Lake Champlain got both Shepard and the capsule out of the water just 11 minutes after splashdown. That's impressive. Shows how well they planned everything, how ready and efficient the recovery teams were. Getting the astronaut and the spacecraft back safely and quickly, that was crucial to the mission's success. And the state of Freedom 7 after all that. It was in surprisingly good shape, wasn't it? It was. The engineers looked it over and found it was in excellent condition. It had survived the launch, the vacuum of space, the heat of re-entry. They even said that, technically, it could have flown again. But of course, the spacecraft, this important, this historic, deserved a different fate. The fact it was still in such good condition after a mission like that, well, that gave them valuable data, showed them how well it was designed and built, helped them improve the Mercury capsules that followed, and spacecraft design in general. Right. So let's talk about the impact, the legacy of this mission. It was the first time an American had gone into space. A huge achievement. Without a doubt. Freedom 7 proved that an American astronaut could handle the extreme conditions of spaceflight. The G-forces during launch and re-entry, the weightlessness, it all checked out. And it gave them a lot of data about how the Mercury capsule systems performed in actual space conditions. This data was essential, you see. They used it to modify designs, improve procedures for the next Mercury missions, pave the way for longer flights, more complex maneuvers in orbit. But as we said earlier, the Soviets had already done an orbital flight. That kind of took the shine off America's achievement, didn't it? At least internationally. Yes, it did, to an extent. Yuri Gagarin's orbital flight just three weeks before, well, it put the Soviets in the lead, at least in the eyes of the world. But Freedom 7 was still a huge step for the U.S. space program. It laid the ground work provided the experience and data for everything that came after. And now we celebrate National Astronaut Day on May 5th in its honor. That's right. Every year on the anniversary of the launch, we remember this first crewed flight, a testament to courage and ingenuity.
And Freedom 7 itself has been on quite a journey since coming back to Earth, from splashdown to museums, all sorts of places. Quite a tour, yes. NASA gave it to the Smithsonian Institution, recognizing how important it was. It was displayed at the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland for a long time, then moved to the John F. Kennedy Library in Boston in 2012, and for the 60th anniversary in 2021, they had it at the Smithsonian's Stephen F. Udver Hazy Center. Now it's at its permanent home, the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., a real tangible reminder of this pivotal moment in history. And the story of Freedom 7 has found its way into popular culture, hasn't it? Books, films, even video games. It has. Tom Wolfe's book, The Right Stuff, told the story of the Mercury 7 astronauts and their achievements, including Shepard's flight. They made it into a film, too. Very well-known, very influential. And it's popped up in other historical dramas, documentaries, even in the video game Fallout 3, though that's a more fictionalized take, an alternate history. But all these things, they help keep the story of Freedom 7 alive, introduce it to new generations. So, to sum up our deep dive into Freedom 7, it was a truly groundbreaking mission, wouldn't you say? The first step in a long and ambitious journey for the U.S. space program. Absolutely. It achieved its main goals. It showed that humans could handle space flight, and it rigorously tested the Mercury capsule systems. There were challenges along the way, from the preparations to the flight itself. But it was a triumph of technical skill and human courage. Alan Shepard's story, the delays, the frustrations, the eventual success, it embodies the spirit of those early days of space exploration. It does. It makes you think about the pressure they were under, all the technical and human elements that had to come together for that one short flight. How did that one suborbital hop lead to the amazing things we've achieved in space since then? And what does it tell us about pushing boundaries, achieving the impossible? Uh. Something to ponder, isn't it? Maybe our listener will be inspired to learn more about Project Mercury, about those brave individuals who ventured into the unknown all those years ago. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive.